However, if you find yourself explaining or having to excuse your business to your friends, you know, oh, we don't see a lot of you. Where are you? Oh, you know, it's just the beginning. I've just got to work because I can't find someone to replace me or um, so-and-so just quit last minute. So I've got to go in. And you're constantly cancelling on people. You're constantly tired. You're constantly saying, it's just for now. It's just until I find someone. I, I just need to keep spending money or paying off the loan, but it'll pay off. I'll start making money next year. And you're finding yourself constantly having these excuses and these potentials for your business then it very much becomes that toxic relationship that you're excusing to your friends he's not rude he just feels uncomfortable around people that's why he stays in the car or that's why he doesn't want to come out with us we've all been in one of those relationships or have a girlfriend that's been in one of those relationships and it's important to know that you can't catch feelings for your business because a business can be good for right now. It could be exactly what you need for your for your life. Um, you might start at having small children and it fits amongst everything that's going on in your life with small children. But in 20 years time or in 15 years time, you might um, have a divorce or you might have your children grow up and move on to different things. And that business no longer fits with who you are at the moment in present day. And it's okay to know that. And if your business can't change or pivot with you, or if it's in an industry or, or you know, in, in a model that can't really work with whatever has happened, it's okay to know to let it go and move on to something else or to change it entirely. We can't get caught up in this commitment that it's death do us part. Um, because you might have a lot of different businesses that you date until you find the one. And, um, you might never find the the one. You might just go from business to business and that's fine. It's not a reflection of you if your business fails. Just like that ex-boyfriend, when you dump him, it's not a reflection that you weren't right or you didn't do good enough. It's just that he wasn't right for you. And I've seen far too many people in my career not want to accept that, have way too much attachment to the business and way too many feelings in the business that they have a clouded judgment and they go down with the ship and you don't have to go down with the ship. It's really important when you are on a poker table playing poker that you know your cards and sometimes you get dealt bad cards, but it's only so far a bluff will take you. You really just need to know to play the game properly. And if you are fully aware of your surroundings and what you have, that's the only time you can make smart business choices. So I talk a little bit more about that in my chapter and give some examples of some um, business owners that I've seen in the past make those mistakes. It's very easy for us to make and really identifying, am I making that mistake or am I giving up too soon? Because sometimes it can be really hard to make that call. You don't know if um, you just need to pivot and step outside your comfort zone or if it's time to call it a, you know, call it a day. And I talk a little bit more about ways that you can really understand because the reality is when we start listening to our gut instinct and we really trust in that, we find that we always had the answers. Um, it's just really about trusting that you can um, listen to it, really. That's fantastic. There's so much rich content in your chapter, Al. I think it's, it's going to be just invaluable, especially for women who are starting out and those, you know, all of those things that you've talked about, overcapitalizing and um, not getting caught up on the feelings and all of those things, I think is going to be really valuable. I think the thing is um, women are really starting to step out and look at owning their own business. And one of the main reasons is because it, nine to five really doesn't work. And so many of us have had careers and then we've had children and we've stayed home and we've weighed it up and by the time you pay for daycare by the time you work out who's going to care for the kids you're actually paying out of your pocket to go back to work and it's not really financially feasible so so many women have had to give up their career because they simply can't afford to go back and it just doesn't work with their life and they don't want to have to pick um sending their child away 6 a.m to 6 p.m so that they can work doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have ambition and drive anymore. So we're seeing this big trend of women starting up their own businesses and using that creative energy that they have. Um, but unfortunately, we are 
and not really, unfortunately, but the reality is we are emotional creatures and it's very hard for us to differentiate that in business and understand that this isn't one of our children or this isn't something that we have to nurture and love and be loyal to uh, forever. It's something that we have to learn that we have to look at quite clinically and we have to be really strong about it and remember that ultimately this business is there as a tool for us to make money and um, that's what the end game is. De depending on how much you actually want to make and what you want to get out of it, the end game in business is for it to be uh, a return on your investment. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Elle. And thank you to all of our authors who joined us for our panel today. It's my great pleasure to now introduce our next speaker, Emma Allen. Hi, Emma. How are you? Hear me okay? I can. Hello. Hi. How are you going? Really good. Really good. So Emma, I'll let you I'll let you go ahead with your presentation and then we'll do questions at okay. the end. Is that how you'd like to run things? Yeah, that sounds great. Um Pete, can I click record on this? It's just asking for your permission. Yes, you may. Okay. We're recording at this end as well. Oh, okay. I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Good afternoon, ladies. I'll just share my screen now so we can all have a look at the slides. There we go. Is that popping up okay? There we go. There we go. Yep. Now it's working. Beautiful. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join me this afternoon. My chapter is around carving your own pathway. So I established active property investing when I was nine months pregnant with our second child, my son. And I had worked in corporate, I'd worked overseas, I've been in industries such as sports management, I've um, done learning and development. I've actually dipped my toe in many different ponds. And I think when I look back at all the experience that I was able to accumulate over my professional career, it brought me to a place where I was really, really ready to channel every lesson and learning um, that I had acquired into a business that I really believed in and, and, and passionate about. So throughout that journey, there was something that always excited me about business. And I think I really like and are drawn to the idea of having a thought or a concept and making that into something that's tangible that people can buy or experience. So I think I've always had a little bit of an entrepreneurial lens to the way that I approach things, and that's really, really helped me in terms of carving my own pathway. Because sometimes in our journeys, we can kind of stumble along and we might accidentally find ourselves in a career. But as business owners, we now need to do things with much more intent. We need to take action and make decisions with purpose. And from that, we can formulate strategies that can make our businesses stand out. They can distinguish what our businesses stand for, but most importantly, that you can use this to progress the business forward. And ultimately, that's what we really need to do. So carving your own pathway is really putting into the palm of your hands the ability to create what you want that business to look like. And, and that's what my, my chapter really focuses on. What I find is that sometimes we put expectations on ourselves. Um, and it can also, expectations can also come in the form of the environment that we're in. Um, and, and I see it as resistance. So for us to be the best that we can be and play our hardest, we really need to be free of all these expectations and all this baggage that sometimes we put onto ourselves. These are things like, like fear, um, it's things like community pressure, even just as women, um, it's things that we might have expectations wise from our families even, um, or, or what we should be doing as mothers. So all of these things that we place on ourselves and that the society places on us, it, it, it becomes a hindrance. And I think it's really unfair because we're going to have enough to do just running the business let alone carry the emotional baggage with us. 
So my suggestion is if you do want to carve your own pathway, that you need to distance yourself between all of those expectations that perhaps are unrealistic and just are unuseful and really detach so you can be free and you have the space to think and create and really understand who you are and what you want to be when you go out there. So that's why I really love this quote from Pink. And she says her definition of freedom is knowing who you are and then being that no matter what everyone else is doing. Because it's pretty clear that we live in a world where information is just thrown at us. Everything goes at a really high speed. And, you know, competition is fierce. There's a lot of comparison. It's too easy for us to think, oh, I'm a new business. Gee, look at that other guy. Look how well they're doing. All of that is too much of a distraction. So carving your own pathway gives you a focus. Um, and with that focus means that you can just work on the journey uh, because the journey is actually what gets you the profitability and the outcomes and the growth and everything that you think you should be achieving as a business. So this takes it away from being a focus of just uh, a, an endpoint to the business and rather focusing on how um, the quality of the journey that you're going to be a part of. So when I got to that point in my journey and I thought, right, now is the time that I need to, to go out on my own. I think it really took multiple elements uh, to come together because uh, initially I had a really strong career. Um, I now had two children and it was incredibly important and difficult to balance the two, but important that I made that happen. So I had a personal pathway that I was pursuing and my professional pathway and that personal pathway had to merge at some stage. Um, and the best way possible was to, for me to start my own business. Um, but I was not prepared to give up motherhood um, for my skills and my talent because I truly believed there was something of value I could bring. Underpinning all of this was my ethics. So I wasn't prepared to just slap together a business. I was only going to do it if I could do it right. So with those three things in, in consideration, I built the structure of the business to be able to support our clients, but, but for me to be able to step back um, and to also delegate segments of that structure so I could have a team around me or a village, as we often talk about, a village around me to be able to execute that strategy um, and continue forward with myself, having less and less input in the operations and more in the strategic side. So when we talk about strategy, um, the idea of when someone reaches this point or if you have a business and you've hit a rut, when you get to this point, you do have a choice on which way that pathway goes. And I say this because even outside of business, sometimes we find ourselves on a path of life that we think, oh, I'm, I'm going down this bad path because I'm hanging around some pretty bad people and that's what I'm destined to be. Well, that's not true. If you are on a pathway and you you recognise that you're unhappy and you don't want to be there, people do have the opportunity to change directions. So the first point about carving your pathway is you get to decide which way you want to go. And that's really important. And when people actually understand what that means and how powerful that is, it lets go of all the baggage of the past and it gives you a completely back canvas to go, okay, well, what am I prepared to build for the future? The other concept that I really hope people understand is that the idea of carving means that every day you do a little bit, but you have to turn up every day to be able to chip away because being an entrepreneur or having a successful business isn't as easy as flicking on a light switch. It doesn't just happen overnight. So the idea and the concept of carving means that you chip away every day and some days it's going to feel like you're going nowhere. And other days, you're going to have some really big progress. But if you are making an effort and showing up and giving your all every day and embracing all the opportunities that you have, then inevitably, the business will move forward. And it will move forward with some intent and direction because you, you're, you're chipping away in a certain direction. So these two things together means that really anybody can start a business. We all have to start somewhere. Um, anybody can change their direction of life. It's all about just identifying that you do want to change and then finding the direction that you want to move in. So that's why carving your own pathway is really important. 
Um, additionally, you get to do it in a way that actually builds a brand, that builds a reputation that stands out from other people, but also is truly authentic to yourself. That is, is incredibly important. So moving forward is uh, the ultimate goal. We can't stand still. Um, time will move without us anyway, and the world is moving. So we, we do want to find ways that we can progress the business, grow the business, evolve, uh, and continue to be successful. When we're doing things with intent and purpose, it also means that we have um, some a way to propel the business forward. Um, but in a booming economy, this is really, really easy. When everybody has money and they're confident and they're happy to spend it, it means that multiple industries will thrive. But when things change, whether it's an industry-specific change or whether it is something global like what we've just been through this year, um, when do you notice that change and then what do you do? Because often when the wind changes, unless a business owner can understand how that's going to impact either the buyers or the business itself, then you, you need to shift and pivot or change really, really quickly to be able to respond to that change. Um, it's interesting to see that unfortunately not all businesses have you know, been able to survive this year. Um, but it makes you wonder that what was their structure like and how strong was it before the impact of, of, of change? And, and how do we make ourselves and build our businesses so we are resilient to these sort of things? But at the end of the day, everyone is doing the best that they can. And I think with these five concepts, I've really just drawn on five key areas, I think, that will help a first-time business owner or a new business owner. Um, but what we really want to create is a magnet that's going to attract the type of clients that you want. And these sort of things will be a bit of a compass as to how you go about doing that. So if we look at the first one, clarity of direction. So I'm assuming the screen's blank because this is what it looks like when you don't know where you're going. You're going to be kind of fumbling your way through the dark until potentially you might stumble across the right path or trip on something that you didn't know was there. But I love the quote in Alice in Wonderland when the Cheshire Cat says, well, you know, well, Alice says, which road should I take? And he says, well, where do you want to go? Now, Alice doesn't know. So naturally, then it doesn't matter what road you take. So where do we want to go with our businesses? Where do we want to take our business? Some of this actually comes down to how clear we are about who we are as a business and what we do and what, what do we represent as a business. This is where a lot of the branding and the brand recognition comes because it's, it's one thing to say that you're an ethical business and it's another thing to behave in a way that aligns with that message. And I think alignment to messaging is absolutely paramount, but also very powerful because with that builds consistency and trust and people like to know where there is certainty, um, especially if they're going to spend a significant amount of money. So building a brand comes from this kind of clarity, but this is also an opportunity as entrepreneurs that we get to build our legacy. What is it that we want to leave on the world that actually makes a difference? So it's a chance to make perhaps a part of the industry different or to create a completely new industry, which I'm sure the pressure of 2020 is, is going to be a catalyst for new businesses and new ways of doing things. So I find the band and legacy stuff really exciting uh, but it all comes down to consistency and delivery of your message. We work in an industry um, that is notorious for not necessarily looking after its buyers. So we work in real estate. And after years of working for larger companies and you know, doing quite well, there was a bit of misalignment between what I believed and what I saw was the behaviour, the standard of behaviour um, in the industry. And so... 
starting active costly investing was incredibly liberating for me because I got to project my vision, my values, the choices, and uphold the standard that I expected as a buyer, and why shouldn't everybody else get that level of service? So it meant that we could create a brand that represented quality. Quality is really important for us because it's the quality of the property, the quality of the service, it's the quality of the team, and it's the quality of the partnerships and everything else that comes around it. So it meant that we were able to create an environment which is really empowering um, and really safe and that clients would really appreciate that quality because we weren't going to work with junk. Um, and with that comes an attitude and a culture to our business um, that people feel really comfortable to, to, to move you know, significant amounts of, of money into an investment that will eventually move them forward. So in terms of the way we formulated the brand is real estate for us is just a vehicle. Property is just a vehicle, but our clients are family. They're individuals, they're people that are trying to get their foot on the property ladder. There are people that have gotten to retirement and they've realized that, hey, where our kids have finished school now, no more private school fees, but we only have 10 to 15 years for retirement. Now what do we do? So all of these different types of people are coming to our business because they want help to get further ahead, but they also want to make really good, well-informed decisions. So that's what our business does, and that's why our branding and the image that we portray um, is about our clients. It's less about the properties, and yes, you will find some properties on, on our website, but you're not going to find those slogans that say, hey, become a billionaire overnight type thing because it's not us. And it's, it's not true. We're really working with everyday Australians because anybody can invest in property. They just need to know how to do it. And so this becomes the centre of our business and it really is the core of our branding that we can look after different types of investors and make sure that their pathway is successful in the journey. We have um, a client that's just had a baby at 7 a.m. this morning. And, um, and so this is, this is a buddy that's going out for the new baby. But um, the husband emailed me late last night and he said, Emma, I, I can't sign all the documents. It's really too hard. And I went, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll print them off. I'll get them to you. It's no drama. I know how much pressure this family is already under because of the timing of the baby, but they desperately want their first home. And so, of course, we're going to make it easier for them. We will just do what we need to to support them to be successful. It's pretty simple from our perspective. Um, but that's where the clarity of the messaging is really important. And with that, you can make decisions as you move forward that align to that clarity. So our marketing won't ever be cold calling in the middle of dinner time to try and do a deal. No, it won't. It's actually around information and education. Um, we won't, um, you know, collaboration as well. So the, the partners that we work with, again, align to the ethics of the business. So that, that's what we really need to do to, to move forward. The second concept um, that I was going to talk about briefly is actually around resourcefulness. Now, often when we start business, we identify a lot of the things we don't have, like money, for example. We only have a small amount of resources and it's not unusual for many businesses to start in someone's garage or in someone's spare room. That's, that's, it's a lot, how a lot of us have started. But just because we don't have the resources doesn't mean that we can't be resourceful. And the reason why I've put the peg on the screen is that there is an obvious use for a clothes peg, it's to hang up clothes. But if we actually looked around us, at everything we have within our reach, how do we optimize that resource? So resourcefulness is making the most of what you have. When we start out in business, we are forced to do that, and I actually enjoy it because the entrepreneurial spirit is to create something out of nothing. And to be resourceful means that perhaps there is more than one way to get what we need for the business at that point in time. If that means that you order just one batch of stock instead of the next six months batch of store, stock, then so be it. If that means that the, the website is basic as opposed to 
fully whiz bang, then so be it. But resourcefulness means that you just look at alternative ways to be able to generate what you need. Um, we were looking for ways during the last property downturn to engage our clients. And so by identifying that we have such a great track record, you know, refer a friend became such an important channel for us to continue doing the, during the downturn. It was actually existing clients making sure that the business was ticking along. So if that resourcefulness means that you engage and you collaborate with ways to be able to connect with the clientele that you're looking for. Um, but look, we all started somewhere. And I think this is the important thing that if you are starting a new business, that you remember that every successful entrepreneur had a first business. So the most important thing is that you really start. So the less money that you have to throw at things, the more creative you have to be. The only limited resource um, that we have as entrepreneurs is our health and our time. So our health and our time will be, um, we don't want to make that the cost of our success. So eventually we really do have to make sure our structures and our businesses can thrive without us having to sacrifice the time or the health, um, which is our only limited resource. Everything else can really be recreated. So I think that's really important. Um, when it comes to investing, we work with people of, from all walks of life and and different professions, different forms and levels of income. Um, again, our role is to help them make the most of what they have. So if people are investing within their means, they can still invest. We've got families on really moderate budgets, but because they've been so strategic in their investing, they've actually accumulated multiple properties. So there's a myth that to be an investor, you have to be wealthy. It's actually quite the contrary. The investing and the properties are what help make people wealthy. And it's helping people get further ahead financially if they did nothing at all. So there is no one type of investor, like there is no one type of business owner. So therefore, make the most of what you have available to you and you will inevitably be able to move forward. There's always more than one way to do things. There we go. That's my quote. It's not about how much you have. It's about what you do with it that really matters. Finding and creating opportunities. So this is an interesting one um, because I really believe that we are attuned to whatever we're used to. So entrepreneurs have a really good understanding of connection. And I think there was a speaker earlier that talked about having a lens. We have a lens that sees certain things and how um, different factors connect and influence and interact. That's really what we need to develop. We need to create this heightened sense of awareness that we can understand and see things and that's where opportunities can arise because then we know what conversations we need to be having. Um, interestingly enough, the, the sh quick shift in the economy that happened in 2020 actually put so much pressure on businesses that some needed to, sh to change what they were doing incredibly fast just to survive. Um, and I've got Stage Kings as an example because I have really loved watching their story evolve during 2020. They were, um, they create stages for things like the Commonwealth Games. I think they did like Australian Ninja Warrior. Um, they do these incredible sets. Um, and of course, when COVID-19 hit, um, they, that industry pretty much decimated. So their stage kings um, were incredibly worried about the hundreds of people that relied on them um, and their staff. But in identifying that people needed to work from home, they used what they had. And, and again, this is utilising the, the two first concepts of understanding what you can offer and your value, and then secondly, resourcefulness. And they pivoted to become ISO key. So isolation. At that point in March, a lot of people needed desks because everyone had to work from home. So out comes ISO King with these newly designed desks. Um, I mean, they've created beautiful things like um, wine racks and um, shelving and even uh, like tabletops for kids for their Lego. 
that they, they were just incredibly creative, but they did this really quickly. So I think the opportunity for them was the speed to response and the speed to adapt and to completely shift what they what they had into something of new value because there was a different kind of demand from their consumer. Um, they've recently released the one on the left, which is this picnic set. They've even made Christmas trees um, out, of, out of their products. So they've got more than 60 products which are completely different from the set and the stages that they were doing eight months ago. And so um, I saw a post, they've sold more than 30,000 pieces as far as Europe and Ireland. Um, they've also donated 80,000 to charity and now they have 100 employed staff which were ex-crew um, from Stage Kings. So I just think this, this business is just phenomenal because this is what we need to do as entrepreneurs when the pressure is really on. Um, this is quite a dramatic shift for them, but they had to because their industry completely, they lost a lot of their, um, their work for the rest of this year, so they had to do something. But I think for us to be able to find and create opportunities, um, again, it's about just understanding what is available to you, what's happening to you, and when you have a goal in mind, then it's about creating steps to achieving that goal. That is the pathway. Um, so if there is a big goal in the business, then make sure there are smaller milestones and then smaller steps to achieving each milestone. Um, that is how you create opportunities. You need to be able to just keep having conversations and making that connection um, with those smaller goals and milestones to get you further ahead. So finding and creating opportunities, it, there's always opportunities. It's just a matter of being able to find them. Okay, so this is something that when I started the business, I promised, made myself, promised myself. Following your intuition is harder to explain because that's what intuition is. But I believe that intuition is really your compass. It's your compass that will tell you if something doesn't feel right and when things align, there won't be any resistance and you go for it. So intuitively, um, sometimes it's harder. It's harder for some people to hear and, and identify what their intuition is saying. Um, but I remember in I was in high school and my best friend once said we were, we're out clothes shopping and she said, do you know what, if you hesitate, that's a no. And that piece of advice has actually stayed with me all my life because if there is hesitation, it means that something doesn't align. When it comes in business, into business, um, if there is hesitation, if I find myself hesitating, sometimes it's a clear out no. I've walked into opportunities before and, and it, it looked right, the numbers stacked up, you know, reputable supplier, um, and then they would say something. Something like, hey, don't worry about the deposit, put it on a credit card. And automatically, my intuition just goes, oh, red flag. Red flag, run as far away as you can. Um, so it's interesting how once you know where you stand, that if there is something that doesn't align to it, you can identify it really quickly. Um, I've walked out of business meetings going, yeah, that's never going to work. Even though it sounded like they wanted to work with us, if it wasn't going to align, it doesn't work. Other times, I really, really wanted to pursue opportunities, but was hesitating. In that case, I needed to explore further. I needed to ask more questions and get more clarity around what the deal actually was before I could say yes or no. Um, but I think the, the good way to approach opportunities is to really be open because sometimes opportunities come from places that you don't expect it to. So I will always give it at least the assessment to identify whether or not it's going to work for us. But intuitively, if there is something that just doesn't feel right, then it could be just not worth um, risking uh, for the short term. It's not risking the, the reputation or the brand for a quick win. That's, that's pretty much the, the bottom line for us. However, intuitively, when things come together, you can have the most powerful collaborations. When there is a lot of alignment from a professional, from an ethical perspective, 
So those partnerships are the ones that you can really call upon when you need it. Um, they will be the ones that you can strategically plan with for the future, and they'll be the ones that you can grow your businesses alongside each other. And I think intuitively when you find those partners in your business, um, they are incredibly powerful and they are honestly um, the reason why our business is able to thrive in, in challenging times. It's because of those partnerships. But stick to your guns and uphold um, your values, your personal values and your business values. Uphold that and you will have the correct alignment. Um, but intuition, your compass, that's um, harder to explain, but, but definitely follow it. The final piece of the five um, that I'm going to touch on today is paving a way for others to succeed alongside you. So here is our team, um, we're missing one member. But the reason why I suggest that we pave a way for others to succeed is because inevitably for us to be successful, there would have been many, many people who played even the smallest role to help us being successful. It makes sense that we need to invest in the success of others around us as well. I really believe that we need to invest in ourselves. We need to heavily invest in our teams and we also need to invest in the communities around us um, because it makes sense that if we have just walked a hard journey and we've found our own pathway, that the least we can do is to light up that pathway so others can follow us and others can also achieve their, their dreams and objectives and aspirations as well. So whether it's your teams or your clients, um, if we have a choice to either um, make our interaction something that's memorable and helpful, um, rather than being something that's transactional and really short. Um, understanding different businesses have different kind of levels of interaction, but most definitely when it comes to professional services, um, we want to be seen as professionals, not just real estate agents, because there is so much depth um, to what we do um, that we really build these long-term relationships. And these clients are with us for months, so we're looking after them in years for some of them. We're looking after them for a very long time. Um, in terms of our team, everybody has their own aspirations and I absolutely love seeing each one of them evolve and thrive. Um, and I think one particular way to keep people engaged is to make sure that we can support them um, and that they also feel very valued because everybody plays an incredible um, role to making the whole business succeed. So extending that to our charity work, I'm finding that a lot of the authors that are a part of this book have some form of charity that they're involved with. Um, we help people build houses uh, and wealth in um, locally, but we also want to build houses, and we have built houses in Cambodia um, through the work of Global Village Housing, which is an Australian social enterprise. Um, we have to date uh, built and built one school and renovated a school. Um, because those communities, um, especially in these rural parts of Cambodia, they really have no chance, very little chance. So we've loved going and building relationships with these families and communities um, through GVH. So it's only a small drop in the ocean. There's so much more. But I, uh, but I honestly think that if we are successful, then we have a responsibility to make sure that there's a multiplying effect and the people around us can also succeed. Um, so that's why my fifth part of that concept is paving a way for others to succeed. So carving your own pathway, it's really another way to say, act with clarity and purpose, and you can create the life or the business that you desire, but do show up mentally, physically, and emotionally, and you will never be moved forward. Um, when it comes to backing yourself, I couldn't agree more because if you picked up the ball and you wanted to throw it, if you hesitate, it's not going to go very far. Um, if you jumped on a bicycle and wanted to ride down the street, if you hesitate, you will fall off. So I think in everything that we do as entrepreneurs, we really have to back ourselves 100% because if we do, other people will also back us and they will back our business. And that consistency and certainty is really what a lot of people need right now and, in, and have always needed, and we really need to provide that stability. But my last message is that backing yourself doesn't mean that we think we're going to get it right every time. Backing yourself means that, that you know that no matter the outcome, that you will be okay. 
thank you so much for uh, listening in today. And uh, I hope there are some tips um, that will be useful. Thank you so much, Emma. That was such a great presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. So do we have any questions from the audience? I'd love to uh, take questions now. If you've got a question, just turn your camera on and unmute and jump in and have a chat with Emma. Any questions or comments? So Emma, I loved your presentation and I really love your style. I feel like the real estate industry can be quite a masculine industry. It's quite male dominated. Yeah. Usually. Like it's the, the bravado and the sales and the, you know, the big shots, um, which perhaps that's a stereotypical view of real estate industry <laughs> that I have. Yeah. Um, however, what I love about what you do is you seem to really bring um, a lovely balance of feminine energy with the masculine, you know, running it and, and the sales and things, but that feminine energy of really looking after your people, um, tapping into your intuition, uh, using creativity and resourcefulness, very feminine sort of concepts and ideas that you bring to this very masculine kind of industry of selling and, and buying and selling and investing. Uh, can you talk us through that? Oh, look, I always just put myself in the shoes of the buyer. What does the buyer actually need? And, and I, I, I'm glad that we're different and you can, you can kind of separate because I, I think real estate is just known for sales and property. And the focus has always been on the property rather than the investor. But to actually succeed, the investor needs to know much more than what the property price is. Um, otherwise, they're, they're, they're doing this massive leap of faith and just hoping that the salesperson is doing the right thing. So, so our model is actually about empowering each individual to do this successfully. So very, very different from us, me sitting down with a team saying, okay, you need to sell 50 properties. It's really, really, really different. Um, in terms of the way that lots of companies work, again, I'm not pointing any fingers, but it's, it's I think a lot of people have been burnt and a lot of families have, have ended up investing and not realising what they're getting invested, getting themselves into. Mm. So uh, I've seen it all. I've heard it all. I've sat in different seminars and it's, it's not nice. And I, it's not a nice place to be when you know that you're being preyed on. So our attitude is more around creating that safe space. Yes, they can ask us anything. We'll look them in the eye and tell them because why shouldn't we? It's that level of transparency for us to say, we're not hiding anything, so we will, we will help you, we will tell you. Um, and if we don't know, we'll find out. And I don't, I just, it, it comes quite easy for us. And we've been a team of females up until now, actually. And we're just on, about to onboard two males, which is, which is fine because I think they bring a very different element. And again, in, in terms of recruiting, it's recruiting around um, what their ethics are based on as well and different skill sets are actually going to just enrich the diversity and the strength of the consulting team. But the alignment to values is really important. So I knew that this environment would leave some talented people opening open to career changes. Um, and I just said to myself, I've just got to have the gut that when I find the right people um, that we can grow with integrity. Yeah. So we, yeah, we'll just keep focusing on that piece. I think that mm. this is, you know, it's a different way of doing property, but it's an important way for people to learn. It really feels like it's all about the relationship. Like you really are taking the time to get to know the clients and what, what they're wanting to achieve and who they are and what their goals are. That seems to be um, a very important part of what you do. Yeah, we, we have to understand what their plan is to be able to work a property that fits in their plan. So it's very different from just following hotspots um, because if a company wants to buy in a suburb that sounds good when you, when you talk about it in the barbecue, but it's bleeding them dry financially, that, that's, not, that's not good. So it's the reverse. It's about the family and then making the property fit the family. And that way they can go on holidays and still live their life and not be tied to a ball and chain. But in the background, they've got this asset that's ticking away. Um, and in the future, they'll have equity for their kids to buy a home because the, the value of properties in Sydney is more than 10 times the average salary. 
So the discrepancy between wages and property values is just getting further and further apart. Um, so, you know, and it's the same with young professionals. They can't afford to buy in Sydney, so they rent best. And that's a concept that we're talking about constantly. So they're not just sitting there thinking, oh, we're going to rent for the rest of our lives. You can get in. You just have to know how. Yeah, that's fantastic. It really feels like you're helping people so much with the way that you're doing this and, and running the business. Yeah. Thank you. We enjoy it. We enjoy it uh, because it's a lot of hard work and I think a lot of the, the authors will say the same. Uh, but it's incredibly challenging to, to run a business. Um, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, it's exhausting, of course. But at the end of the day, would I be doing anything else? And I, I wouldn't because it is fulfilling. We're doing something with purpose. Um, and we're also, I'm showing my kids that there are many different ways that you can have a career um, and I show them the full the full spectrum of colours too, piece, so they get the whole roller coaster <laughs> with me. But I think that's good. So they don't think that mum's bulletproof. They see me throughout the whole thing. But the most important thing is that we're incredibly resilient. So we bounce back. Mm. And I think bringing our kids along on this journey is important too, um, showing them that you can have an idea and you can make that happen. That's an important yeah. lesson for kids to learn that, you don't have to just, you know, get a job and work nine to five and you're kind of stuck there. You can have an idea and go out on your own and make things happen. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I, I do a lot of it for around financial literacy as well, um, especially for young girls. So I was inspired by um, one client in particular um, who came to us as a, in her 20s as a young investor. And um, she had the backing of her parents to start with and then that kind of changed but she pushed on and she did it. And I, and because of that experience, um, I wrote an e-book about women and property. So I am really inspired about the client because of how, um, how much focus she had as a young person to be able to do it on her own, even after being told, hey, we'll help you. But actually, no, we won't. No, you're on your own. <laughs> and she still did it. So I think financial literacy is, a, is a, quite a big gap um, that's missing um, for, our, for our kids as they're growing up. And it's something that even a lot of adults um, don't understand. So, so we're, you know, we're really here to help them um, kind of utilise those skills. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think financial literacy is something that uh, we need to get out more about that out in, in society, especially yes. for women. And it changes. It changes so much. We're, we're here looking at, you know, New South Wales changing stamp duty. Um, and we have to be a part of the lobby groups to protect um, investors' interests. And, and that's not to say that, you know, we're, because sometimes investors are kind of um, pigeonholed into these incredibly wealthy people. They're everyday mums and dads. I think that's what people have to realise, um, that they, they too have their own um, struggles and risks, and we're really trying to minimise those things. So all we want is a fair playing field. That's, that's really what we're, we're lobby, we lobby for. Mm. And you were talking about um, intuition as something that you use in your business. Can you tell us a bit more about, about that? Um, yes. I, I, look, I think in real estate sometimes uh, when there's money to be made, there's lots of people that want it. And often when things are too good to be true, they really are. And you can see it. And I, I think the more you um, have experience and expertise in a particular area, it's even more obvious and your intuition will pick up on that really quickly and go, no, that's not right. Um, but, you know, I have gone into meetings with potential business partners and, and thought, oh, something just doesn't feel right and I, I can't pursue it if my intuition says, yeah, iffy. Even if the words are coming out right. Mm -hmm. if, if it's not there, it's not there. Um, on the flip side, when it happens, oh, it's wonderful. It's really, really good to find partners that you align with and you can just do so much. And you see a future there. It's beyond just, hey, it was a nice coffee. There's an actual future and a, and a and synergy between two businesses. I think that's really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the work that you're doing with building the houses in Cambodia, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it was just really nice to find an Australian social enterprise that was, and it's an Australian design, that empowers Cambodians to help Cambodians. 
So every now, usually every three to six months, so quarter or two quarters, um, we'll sponsor a house and then we've, we've brought it into our network of partners. So they're starting to sponsor houses and gifting them to these families. So their houses on stilts because it floods a lot, uh, but it's local materials, local labour. Um, it's got a solar panel on the roof. For the very first time, the poorest of the poor in these communities, the first time they've ever had a front door. Oh so, you know, it's, and because if they had a pot and another, someone else wanted to steal it, you could steal it. And so it, it's quite an emotional journey um, to have gone there so many times. Really sad that we can't go this year as well. Um, and not sure when we're going to be able to go back. But um, we've built some really strong friendships with the GVH team. Um, and now the communities remember us. But do you know what, Pete? I can only count to 10 in Cambodia. I can't speak much of it at all. But we just seem to be able to communicate. It's just, it's pretty magical. That's incredible. Such a beautiful story. And I love that your business is giving back in such a tangible way and really changing people's lives. It's, it's incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and look, it's in alignment with what we do as well with housing. Um, and the schools, the schools, was, it was just something we, it just came to fruition again, intuitively, just went, what do you need? There are other people that can sponsor houses, but what do you need that's bigger? And they said, well, we've built all these houses in this village. They really need a school that. And we went to see the school and all there. It was, uh, it was barely a shack. You couldn't even call it a shack. No resources. Poor teachers had nothing to teach with. So um, we did a few fundraisers over the last few years and, and managed to build two. So that's that's a good achievement because it's going to be there for a long time. And water, water wells. We have to build more wells and toilets um, because one of the reasons why girls stop going to school is because they get their periods and they've got nowhere to go because there's no toilets. So they just don't, they stop going to school. So that was another big, big driver. And um, we did an auction in, at one of our fundraising nights and we we auctioned off the toilets and someone paid a few thousand dollars just for the girls to have a toilet. So, so it's really cool what you can do and what you can create. And I think um, our team enjoys um, being able to put on these different events because we want to be memorial, <laughs> memorable and we want to engage our partners as well as our clients. Yeah, that's fantastic. And when you go across, do you, some of your um, team go with you? Who goes when you go over? Uh, it's usually, it's usually me. Uh, it's, my, it's been myself and a couple of girlfriends. Um, no, the team have been fantastic. They keep the, things, the, the business running back home. <laughs> but it would be lovely. It would be, great to, it would be great to do a team one, one year, yeah. when it's all safe to go again. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Well, congratulations on everything that you've achieved with your business. It's just incredible. And I love your whole, your ethics and the way that you approach business. It's just beautiful. Thank you so much, Peace. I, I, look, even with the book, intuitively, I had this thing, this urge to go, you know what, I'm just going to put in my submission. <laughs> and here we are. So, I, again, I think when, when stars align and things are meant to happen, they'll happen. Yeah, I'm so glad that you did put in your submission because, yeah, I feel the alignment with everything you're doing. It's just beautiful. So beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peace. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, everybody who's joined us today. If you're watching live, if you're watching the recording, if you want to get in touch with Emma, uh, her details were here before. Emma, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, probably our website. So it's www.activepropertyinvesting.com.au. Perfect. Thank you. So if you have any questions for Emma, just get in touch with her. And that concludes day two now. Um, but join us again tomorrow where we'll be hearing from more of our authors. We'll have workshops and author panels happening and um, back here tomorrow. Thanks so much, everyone. Enjoy your day. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Pete. Bye. Bye.